thanking our fantastic moderator and speakers from our previous panel. Our final panel today and the GPA open session program is a call to action and will be moderated by Mr. White. Often, privacy is framed in the context of counterbalances and we have been told we must choose between privacy or technological awareness or national security or any number of other laudable goals. But this is a false dichotomy. The solution is not to choose privacy or, or something else, but to develop a strategy for privacy and. Without further ado, Mr. White, please begin when you're ready. Thank you. There you go. Good afternoon, everyone. So in Bermuda, I'm not allowed to continue with the presentation until you say good afternoon back. That's a rule here. So, so let's try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for indulging us with that. I'm very excited to uh, have this illustrious panel up on stage with me today. Uh, this, this session is, is called A Call to Action. Uh, and the reason for that is, is we want to take a lot of the things that we've talked about this week and, and discuss how we can put those into practical terms, how we can make them happen. What, what are things that we can do actively right now in order to, to bring these things into effect. Uh, and uh, and I, I discovered earlier this week that Malcolm on the, on the end and I are uh, both big jazz fans. And so uh, with that in mind, this is intended to, this is, this is going to be kind of a jazz inspired uh, session, uh, but particularly if you, if you know anything about jazz. So Dave Brubeck and Bebop and things like that. Uh, the, the idea being that you get a very talented group of people together and everyone makes their own riffs, everyone uh, takes one thread and adds to it, changes it, passes it along to the next person. So I'm hoping that we can take the motifs that have come out throughout this entire uh, open uh, session and, and weave them together uh, in, in some coherent way. Uh, and, and if it can be harmonic, that would be even better. So, uh, with, with that in mind, uh, let's start by introducing our panel. Uh, and so, uh, on the far end, we have uh, Malcolm Crompton, who is the uh, founder and partner of IIS Partners, uh, who gets bonus points for adopting the local attire while he was here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we have Teki Akueta, founder and executive director of the African Digital Rights Hub. And then we get to the alphabetically challenged section where we're all, we're very heavy on the end of the alphabet for, for everyone else. So next we have Wojciech Vivierowski, the European Data Protection Supervisor, Eduardo Usteran, partner at Hogan Lovells, Zikin Young, Chief Executive at the Singapore Academy of Law, and Dr. Gabriela Zanfir Fortuna, Vice President for Global Privacy at the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, so our, our first thread that we wanted to pick up and try to have a conversation about was the, the idea that's come up a couple of times throughout uh, this event, uh, and that's the question of harm uh, and what, uh, how, how we should be thinking about privacy harms. Do DPAs focus on privacy harms enough? And so I warned you in advance that I was going to be doing this, but so I'm going to throw it to you first, Zeke. How do you think DPAs should be incorporating harm more into what they're doing? Well, I, I think that um, DPAs already do incorporate in, uh, harms into what, what they're doing. We, we, we deal with it in kind of like, uh, well, I used to do, deal with it in, in, in one of two aspects, right? How do you uh, prevent, right? And in the case where you are actually investigating, how do you actually identify the harm, the severity, and the impact of the harm? So, so that's something that, that uh, we've done. So I think that uh, let, let's, let's start uh, with, with, with this, right? How can you prevent harm? Mm. Uh, and, and I think that uh, as DPAs with data in our title, right, we can take a very data-driven approach. Uh, we've seen in our cases, right, uh, prevention is better than cure. Through the cases that we've seen, it's, it's very, very possible to distill to distill 
the, the, the problems uh, that cause harm, the, 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 um, the issues that uh, com companies are struggling with. And once you have distilled them, you can actually put them into very user-friendly guides, which are especially helpful for small and medium businesses. Uh, for example, uh, we, we had uh, distilled one whole bunch of uh, problems with IT systems. Put out a guide to say that if you do own and run an IT system, here are things that you can do that will prevent, uh, uh, of, that will help you avoid getting into, into problems. We also uh, come across the situations where you know, there are process failures, there are, there are mistakes. Again, distill that into a checklist right, for small and medium-sized businesses. Here are things that you can do, right? And if you did them, you will actually uh, avoid getting into situations. It will prevent uh, harm being caused to data subjects. Uh, the other thing that I think we can do is also uh, to uh, incentivize right, good practices. Now, how do you go about doing that? Right? I think uh, uh, you can do it in two ways. One uh, is that uh, you, you recognize good practices by, uh, well, through uh, enforcement policies. Right? And what, what do I mean? Uh, uh, we, we were fortunate, we were able to introduce in our uh, uh, legislation the option of a statutory undertaking. So basically, if you've got good practices in place, you've got a good system in place, you are able to detect those breaches uh, proactively, come notify us. You had a drawer plan, so your breach management plan in place. It is possible for us to basically uh, give you the time that you need uh, to implement those plans without uh, commencing enforcement action. So that's one way where you can incentivize good behavior. And because um, you, you have these measures in place, uh, it will help reduce harm uh, because you're better able to react and remediate much more quickly. Even in the situations where um, we, we don't accept uh, un an undertaking and we ended up investigating, uh, you can uh, take these good practices in, uh, into account as good mitigating factor and that can actually be uh, reflected in a lower um, sentence. And I think one of the things that's uh, often overlooked right, is that uh, in situations where um, after investigating and you see that there hasn't been a breach, uh, uh, identifying the good practices that had been in place and uh, acknowledging them, right, that also sends a message. I'll end up with this last point. Right? Uh, the other thing that, uh, that's going to be very helpful uh, is to to work with companies with good practices and showcase these good practices. Uh, how do you lift up and uh, identify good role models? Because for businesses, it's easier to see good practices and emulate them than to be told what to do, right? So um, how can you do that? Well, there are a couple of ways, right? One, uh, but, but uh, one of the things that we learned is that uh, you have to be very specific uh, uh, when you identify role models. So it has to be a very focused event. So we've done one, for example, there was a period when we were strengthening and tightening um, uh, our policies around the collection and use of national identifiers. And we were pushing companies to try and uh, adopt digital solutions that were privacy preserving. So identify a bunch of companies that did these, right? Um, showcase them, put out short videos, uh, others saw, and then they, they could follow. Uh, there are other situations where um, part of the, our efforts to do, to push AI, AI governance, uh, we, we had two volumes of a compendium of uh, use cases identifying companies who were prepared to stand, um, show, right, showcase their practices, and it created that, um, I would say, momentum, right? The, 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 the more you see that your neighbor is able to do it and they did it this way, then it's easier for you to adopt these practices. By promoting these good practices, it, it is going to be very helpful for us uh, to prevent harm. Mm -hmm. so, and, and let me follow up on that last point because it's such a great point. Um, a lot of times when I talk to businesses, they and, and I, I talk to one that's doing a great job, and I say, you're doing a great job. Can we do a webinar or something? I, I want to show the community this is possible. Look, yeah. at, look at this person who's doing the right thing. Right. And they always say no. They, they, they say, no, I, I don't want the spotlight. I don't want attention. How, how do you overcome that? The, the honest truth is um, 
you, you won't be able to convince everyone. Yeah. So for, for every uh, one uh, company that we managed to convince to be part of this showcase, we probably had to talk to another three or four more who basically okay. said, no, I don't want that attention. I, I don't want a situation where uh, I'm showcased this year, but two years later, you know, I, I'm involved in an in a <laughs> incident. <laughs> right? They want to avoid that. But I'll, I'll flip it the other way around. It's not to say that none of the uh, companies that we have showcased have ever gotten into trouble later on. There have been one or two who did, right? Because you just cannot prevent some of these things from happening, even with the best of uh, practices and uh, measures in place. But what we did realise is when that happens, and a company who had been showcased before, right, who, who for example had a trust mark before, they tended to react very quickly they tended to be very, very earnest in trying to remediate because they, want, they do not want to disappoint uh, both their own um, board, their customers, the, the regulator. So it's, it's, uh, that actually uh, it's a, it's a good thing that can come out of it. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Riffs on that. Okay. Yeah, I, can, I can quickly add something um, uh, about harms, um, and I think as a community we will be forced uh, more and more to think about harms, to categorize them, to actually think of frameworks where we can define various kinds of harms. And I'm saying that because, as you've seen in all of our conversations in this past two days, um, the development of AI systems, of very sophisticated algorithms, uh, of automated decision making, um, are pushing this uh, nice amorphous, in a way, concept that we've been playing around with harm into very, very concrete um, sort of consequences for individuals, for societies, for community. And I think that as lawyers, we always love to uh, say it depends when we're looking at a case. And then in data protection law particularly, we always have the, well, it's a case-by-case -case basis analysis. It's an, it's, it really depends on, on each case. However, I think um, we can come together as a community again and, and at least create a bit of a framework around how, what type of harms we should be looking at. Um, and and uh, um, also considering that we have uh, increasingly a new generation of legislation like the Digital Services Act uh, in the European Union, which is looking at systemic harms uh, in recommender systems and the algorithms that are used by recommender systems. So um, I, I think we, we have a role to play there in trying to define uh, the type of harms, categorizing them a bit, uh, and, and um, pay, paying attention to that. And we tried to do that some years ago at the Future of Privacy Forum. We have a chart, Harms by Algorithm, uh, published around 2017. And I think it's about time for us to update that. But uh, something to that extent should be helpful for the community. Yeah, I was, I was going to plug that if you didn't, because it's been very helpful at explaining to the community what's the point of all of this. Uh, but I would be at the same time a little bit cautious with uh, uh, dealing with harm as the main uh, assessment uh, goal. Uh, because if the goal is to find the harm and find, find the conversation, uh, compensation for that, then the answer is civil law and the, and the, the thoughts. And uh, probably the data protection uh, well, it is not necessary because we can somehow do it uh, with the uh, classic uh, law. But I, I guess one of the reasons for which uh, the data protection uh, regime has differentiated from the uh, privacy in the civil meaning of this world is that uh, sometimes it's extremely difficult to show the precise harm that happens to precise person that will be compensated, mm -hmm. or the harm is not as uh, uh, shocking uh, uh, to, to, to the public uh, uh, as uh, uh, it may be actually to the, to, to, the, to the final situation of the person. Well, if our uh, information on our badges here at the conference would uh, uh, in, include uh, the information about our political views and about our religious uh, beliefs, it would not any harm to us, but it would be absolutely uh, nonsense uh, from the data protection point of view. These are the sensitive data for which there is absolutely no need to be presented. So the, the processing of the data does not need to be harmful in order not to be needed. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah. Eduardo? Yeah, I think 
to your point, uh, the way I understand harm has been debated by this panel is in, in the widest possible sense of the word so that it accommodates the, the Anglo-Saxon side, the, the <laughs> European side. And I think from a European side, my, my experience, my perspective is that harm in that wider sense is definitely something that is being considered. And when you look at probably the, one of the most basic data protection law obligations, which is to have a lawful uh, basis for the processing. And when we apply the most commonly applied lawful basis, which is legitimate interest, that is basically a harm calculation as to whether the processing of personal data uh, is going to harm or is going to mm, lead to a previous intrusion that is intolerable. So I think that, that exists. But can I, if, can I say something a little bit more controversial, perhaps? Mm -hmm. um, I think we are overdoing harm. I think, by all means, harms need to be taken into account. By all means, harms are a dimension of all of our work in terms of making sure that whatever we allow to do or we, we contribute to do doesn't cause harm. But when you focus on harm, the best thing you, the, almost the best result is to avoid the harm, mm -hmm. where you, so that you, you, you basically end up where, where you started. The question from the point of view, I'm, I think, from a regulator and from all of us as professionals is not just how to avoid harm, but how to contribute something positive. And that something positive may be how to allow people to be more in control of the data or how to ensure that there is greater value to the use of that data in a way that not only is not harmful, but is actually positive to, to the individual, to the community, to, to, to the world at, at, at large. So I think it's just a, the, the reason I'm flagging this is that there is this quite obsession with harm and avoiding harm, and that could lead to basically a, a zero-sum game where, in fact, we're not really positively contributing to, to, to the benefit mm -hmm. of the individuals and, and, the, and the population. Yeah, because they... Yeah, um, I, I, I like to kind of challenge and push back on that, right? Because I think that uh, um, instinctively, we do incorporate severity of harm into our analysis. Uh, and, and look, uh, what, what's um, uh, and your, your uh, intervention has got me thinking is that actually that there's, there's presumed harm and there is provable harm. If you can prove the harm, it's uh, physical injury, unlikely to happen, financial loss, uh, yes, you can have a civil suit, you can pursue that. A lot of what, uh, and, you, and in those situations, there can be situations where uh, 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 as a regulator, you can also investigate. Then there is presumed harm, right? Where uh, the, the mere uh, loss of data is, is presumed to cause some degree of harm. Um, the, the, the mere failure of putting in place a good uh, accountable uh, system uh, is going to uh, expose you to a certain, certain level of harm. But uh, we need to basically articulate, right, what we are looking at uh, when, we weigh, uh, when we look at this harm. It's really um, the likelihood of it happening and the impact of it uh, on an individual. Because once we're able to identify this, it helps us calibrate our enforcement response and also our analysis right, of whether, when we, when we do our impact assessment, it helps us calibrate that. And uh, if we're able to um, uh, do that well, uh, we can actually say that uh, 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 allow certain processing to carry on, right? Or in a case of uh, a breach, right, uh, where it is a lower degree of harm, less impact, we might be able to consider other enforcement uh, results uh, that might be directions and uh, rehabilitative as opposed to uh, punitive and financial penalties. So I think that uh, if you're able to actually uh, develop a framework, is going to be helpful. And I, I can, I can uh, say, they say that uh, most, okay, at least when I was looking at these areas, it was actually something that we did consider. And, and, um, I, I just want to clarify uh, in an answer to, Wojciech, uh, to Wojciech's point, uh, to clarify where my, for my comment came from. And I said at the very beginning that we will be forced to think more and more uh, um, on harms as a community. 
particularly because in classical data protection law, harms frankly do not play such big of a role. Uh, we do have compensation for damages when they happen, of course, and that's a part of it. And then now with the GDPR and uh, the laws afterwards, data protection impact assessments where harms can play a role. But I was primarily thinking about where the technology is going with, with um, uh, frankly, everything that's happening around algorithms, automated decision making, and so forth, and the uh, stage of all of this where we are at right now. And this is what makes me think we will be forced to think a bit more and more about harms also to communities. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get to that point uh, later on in our conversation. Uh, Whenever we're so ready, it's good. <laughs> but but uh, absolutely, fully uh, agree with, with your, um, your uh, view of what you're going to Techie, did I detect you wanted to jump in? Yes, I, I wanted to. I mean, um, in, in one breath, I, you know, I, I really um, agreed with uh, Eduardo on the balance aspect. But then again, thinking and having worked in Africa and working there a lot, I'm, I'm just thinking about probably looking at the harm approach may also be a useful approach for DPAs, particularly from developing economies. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because usually um, these DPAs become leaders in the data protection ecosystem with very limited resources to roll out compliance and all of that. And so without a perspective of looking at these issues from the harm perspective, so if let's say your country is rolling out a national ID a system or there's a new technology that is being adopted, um, having that ability and the capability to look at it from the harm perspective will also enable you categorize or prioritize uh, which areas you should focus on based on the, on the higher risk areas. So I also see the issue of the harm um, approach as a way to actually enable us apply limited resources to areas that, that is quite useful. And, and that's just what I wanted to add to this at this point. Great, Malcolm. Uh, particularly this morning, I was listening to the conversation about the word harm <laughs> and the conversation about the word risk, and I don't think we've properly put the two things together because a harm is when something about information about me is stolen and that something nasty happens because of that. Somebody might be able to steal money from me because it, or I lose my job, or the, whatever is the harm. Risk, as we've said many times today, is about probability of the nasty event happening and the impact of that nasty event happening. And that second thing, the impact, is potentially the harm. Now, risk is actually best thought about in the sense of the trilogy of risk management, prevent, detect, respond. And what you're trying to do in risk management is do as much prevention as you can, but not elimination, because elimination is chasing the tail of a long curve down to infinity dollars. So there will always be some exposure, but prevent is getting prevent right. You can't possibly remediate if you haven't got a detection process. So that's why it's prevent, detect, respond. Prevent is mostly about reducing the likelihood and respond is mostly about reducing the impact of the harm when it happens. One of the interesting things that doesn't come up often enough is that there's two categories of harm, the non-reversible harm and the reversible harm. If you're dead, you're dead. You know, and that's why you put a lot of effort into making sure those kinds of harms don't happen. Yeah. On the other hand, if it's a reversible harm with sufficient funding, resource, effort, you can actually reverse almost anything. Supposing what happens is early in your life, your reputation is so ruined that you're unemployable for the rest of your life because the bad story about you that might actually be wrong follows you everywhere or there's an uh, identity takeover which is just follows you everywhere, that you're no longer ever able to get credit, you're no longer ever able to get work, blah, blah, blah. Think of the money that could be paid to that person to have them say, thank you very much. <laughs> it is a finite sum of money. 
It might be $100 million, but that figure exists. But you can only apply that thinking if the harm is reversible. And if the doctor chops off the wrong leg in the surgery, that's still a non-reversible harm. You know, it's not just if you're dead, you're dead. There are a whole series of non-reversible harms. So when you're thinking about analysing for these things, first of all, you have to think about reversible harm versus non-reversible harm. Really, when you're talking about risk management, you're trying to decide if, if effectively and almost cynically what's an acceptable level of bad things happening in terms of a frequency. But also you're thinking about in terms of the risk management, is there a way of reducing the impact of the harm should it happen at a probabilistic level or a societal level or a community level? So for example, if say uh, you've got an identity management system in place or your identity card is compromised and you then have to spend weeks standing in a queue to re-identify yourself, you have to pay a lot of money to get new cards, you have to go and stand in another set of queues to deal with the bank to get your uh, bank accounts re uh, done and all that sort of stuff, that's a huge harm. But you can actually anticipate that and have wonderful harm management processes such that even though the event happens, its impact is a lot less. Those are all about risk management. But to bring it back to harm, that is when it comes down to the personal. And that's why it's so hard to manage for harm in the world of privacy. Because if somebody is living in an abusive relationship and they choose to flee home, their address is potentially lethal information. Yep. They may die because the abusing partner is able to catch them at the new address and kill them. Most of us in this room probably aren't going to suffer a harm as nasty as that in our lifetimes. It may be just a nuisance or somebody puts a bomb in your letterbox and it goes off or, you know, somebody steals a couple of letters out of your letterbox or whatever it is, but it's not going to be that bad. The problem is, as you're managing for these harms, you don't know which it is. That is why both as a DPA or a DPO, you have to be aware that you can't deal in the averages thinking that happens with risk management. You actually have to get down to the personal and that's why harm has to be thought about not just within the risk management context. Risk management helps you get a lot of the probabilities and the impacts down, but still it could lead to an extreme harm in a circumstance that you haven't predicted, which is why it's so difficult. But I do think it's very important that we think about when we're talking about risk and we're talking about harm, we're not necessarily talking about the same thing, but they are very tightly integrated in how you're thinking about managing for it all. And I don't think that we'd quite reach that point in the discussion today. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, and I also wanted to touch back on, on something Eduardo said when you were talking about not just preventing harm, but also enabling. And, and I think this gets wrapped up into the pr privacy principle of fairness, even. Because we could say, well, is fairness to act in someone's best interest or just act in a way that is not against their interest? Or is it to prevent harm or what have you? Uh, and so I wonder, should DPAs be putting affirmative duties on organizations to make someone's life better with however they process their data? Should there be an affirmative duty? What do you, I'll start with you, Eduardo. What do you think? <laughs> Well, oh, oh, me. If we have a volunteer, we'll so take you, a volunteer. You, you asked me to, uh, to tell uh, DPS how to do their job better, actually. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer is yes. I, I, think, I think, I would like to think that anyone uh, in, in any job in this field goes uh, to work thinking, okay, what can I do to make other people's lives better. Or in, you know, maybe not like that, thinking every single second, but in, in a way, trying to contribute something positive to it. And I think the world of data, I think, needs to be understood, in my view, in the wider context of how we operate today. And we live in a, in, in, in a, in a data world, and we, as individuals, there is so much of us that is out there as our data. And the question is, how can 
all of this information benefit us as individuals and then again the, the, the population and humanity at, at, at large and how the processing of this information <laughs> contributes to that. And I think that has to be embedded in that thinking, in that uh, risk assessment and in that judgment about harms. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it's, it's the right thing to do. Mm. <laughs> Wojciech? No? OK. Check. Yeah, I, I was going to say that um, if you look at the context of data protection law in totality, it's about fairness, right? And so um, where the regulators then have the responsibility to ensure compliance with the law, then that is their job. To, to ensure that, that fairness. What are you going to say? <laughs> I'm really very uh, cautious, uh, once again, with fairness. Uh, fairness <laughs> is an, is an uh, principle which in English language have its own meaning. And we speak English mainly here <laughs> at the conference, so we think that we know what we are talking about. So I have the kind of homework for those uh, who know more languages. Just go on to Article 5 of GDPR, where there is a principle of legality, fairness, and uh, transparency. Uh, transparency, and check in all the languages that you know, and which are the European uh, languages, what are the translations of fairness to the other languages. You will be surprised by the German one. <laughs> you will be surprised how the Portuguese is different from the, from the French and, and Spanish. You will be surprised by the difference between Slovak and Czech, that despite the languages are almost the same. Yeah? So we have completely different things in mind when we think about fairness that we are talking about here. So uh, th that is something to be taken into consideration. But I fully agree that uh, the role of the data protection commissioners uh, is to make the life better uh, with all the problems uh, with assessing what it means uh, uh, in the everyday work of the Data Protection Commissioner. But you can be sure that when I'm leaving home, I'm going to work, uh, and I know that I'm going to work for the good of the society. <laughs> Phew. So, well, th thank you all so much. This, this was a, a, we're one question in, so this was really great. Um, but the, the kind of 1B of this question was thinking, okay, well, how do we take everything we just talked about and, and, and ask, is there a difference between how we handle these things as legacy technology issues and how we handle these things as emerging technology issues? Who wants to go first? I didn't pick anyone for this. <laughs> Gabriella, I, you're I, poised. I feel, like, I, I feel like I already touched a bit on, on this yeah. when I was uh, speaking earlier um, about how the new technologies um, force us in data protection law to, to start thinking more about harms. And, and I think that um, th that is ex exactly the case. We, we are at the stage where um, the development of AI is at this point where, um, and, and all sorts of other algorithmic decision-making systems that are used by uh, social security services to decide who gets a benefit or not. Um, and, and, and so forth. We are at this stage where we need to uh, think in a very structured way about harms and just not let this concept just floating uh, around uh, without uh, some uh, meat on, on the bones. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, maybe my thoughts on this is that um, with new technology, uh, there is the, the what you know and what you don't know, right? Uh, when when um, and, and th th this this comes from past discussions through our regulatory sandbox with industry and all that. Usually, by the time they come and engage the regulator, they've done a bit of homework. They've tried to identify what they think might happen, harm, harm right? That might be caused. They don't come with a totally uh, unprepared. They, they come with some preparation. And with that preparation, it's a lot easier in that, that discussion to really build on it. 
and to really understand, yes, uh, I understand that this is what uh, you, you think might happen. Um, and in the iteration, sometimes we discover new articulations. Uh, sometimes, you know, we don't, right? But uh, that's helpful because at least we are taking a step at identifying. And then once you're able to identify the follow-on steps, as we heard earlier, is that you're better able to manage the risk, the likelihood of that happening, right? And uh, if it does happen, then you can have measures to remediate. But then, of course, there are those situations where, as we, we know, uh, the technology goes out in the market, the identifiable, the known um, uh, risk have been addressed, but a year, two years, five years later, a new set of harm emerges. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I don't know how to deal with that, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it will happen. So I guess perhaps constant monitoring, but I, I don't have any answer for that. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, technological neutrality in this, in this context, in the sense that there is no other way to regulate properly in this area other than being technologically neutral. Because if you try to regulate a particular type of technology, you just can't catch up. You know? And I mean, we're in Bermuda. Um, <laughs> we are about to, in the next few months, PIPA will become law here. The process of development of PIPA has taken years. <laughs> and I was part of that process. And at the very beginning of that process, we, the team that was involved, we thought that this had to be a very progressive law. It had to be a law that was prepared to deal with the challenges of the future. We weren't thinking of generative AI as we know it today. We weren't thinking of uh, facial recognition with biometrics and from uh, in public spaces as we know it today. But we thought that it had to address the challenges of whatever technology is, existed then and in the future. So think from that perspective, you, you, law cannot play catch up with technology. But what law can do is adapt itself to technology as technology evolves. And I think, I would like to think that privacy law or data protection law, as we call it in Europe, is actually very agile when you look at it, at being able to adapt to technological developments. Because some of these principles we've been talking, and, and I'm not saying that law is perfect, but some of these principles we're talking about have existed for 30 years or longer. And they still, they still apply today. The question is how you apply them today. Because if the outcome of applying a particular principle that was drafted 30 years ago is to say, ah, I'm really sorry, we cannot have artificial intelligence anymore. No, it was a good idea, but we cannot do it because this principle is telling us that it's unlawful. I can tell you, first, that's not going to happen from a practical perspective because someone will develop artificial intelligence anyway. But at a more profound level, it's likely to be the wrong outcome. It may not, it, it, I'm not saying that the process of developing artificial intelligence does not need to take into account all the privacy elements and, and uh, data protection compliance requirements within the law. And that, but that the law needs to be interpreted in a way that is cognizant of what is actually happening in the real world and able to achieve the right outcomes as opposed to pulling the plug on a technology or, or, or pulling the plug on the internet when that is not going to really be beneficial for the vast majority of people. I would absolutely agree with uh, Eduardo, uh, thinking that uh, uh, the uh, principles that exist uh, in the privacy and data protection law are uh, to be used for the new technologies this, in the same way as they were for the, uh, for the past technologies. Uh, and the technological neutrality is important. We, we heard about it in the, uh, one of the first panels when we heard the American and European approach saying we have the law that is applying to artificial intelligence probably we have some gaps. Let's talk about the gaps, but generally the law is, and it should be applied from the very, fir from the very first day. Uh, I agree uh, that uh, sometimes we may find the new uh, challenges that we didn't have so far. Uh, for example, f f uh, in, my, in my opinion, uh, part of the blockchain solutions create the problem 
of the, uh, of the processor and uh, controller uh, between the miner and the uh, um, rest of the world, let's say, because it's hard to uh, put the miner into the uh, um, concept of a, a controller processor. That's something to be discussed, yes. Mm -hmm. But generally, there is nothing that, that stopped uh, to use uh, the principles which exist in the world uh, to the new technologies. So, well, then let's turn to question number two. Then. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, I loved we question number one. I was very excited about question number one. So, so question number two, uh, is we've talked about something throughout the last few days, uh, and, and the first component to this question is something we all agree on, which is that data is everywhere. It's involved in everything we do. Uh, we, we all have to have data. Uh, but uh, data protection authorities cannot do everything. They cannot be everywhere all at once. So what, uh, what we need is to figure out how can regulators of data protection work with regulators in other areas who are looking at those matters. And that's something we wanted to bring out in, in this conversation over the last few days. Uh, so, so Malcolm, I wanted to start with you. What do you think data protection regulators can bring in from other types of regulators? Uh, thank you. Uh, I've been giving a lot of thought to this question since you, you posed it to me before, and I'm actually going to approach it from probably three dimensions. One of them is what have other regulators done that we can learn? Uh, another one is what have other data protection regulators done that others of us can learn? And the other one is, is there some useful academic thinking? And I'm going to say that I'm going to, about to give you almost fast food answers that hopefully are implementable tomorrow kind of answers for the people here who are from the data protection authorities. So it is uh, 20 years to, ago today, to use a Beatles song, um, when uh, we held a conference like this in Sydney, it was GPA 25. And one of the speakers was a gentleman called Alan Fells. Alan Fells was the most effective regulator in Australia at the time. He ran the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission which is a similar beast to the US Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and then there's uh, John Braithwaite and the Braithwaite and Ayers Responsive Regulation Thinking. And there's Malcolm Sparrow and the Regulatory Craft. Um, and then there are things like the Federal Trade Commission, which has had to craft out of nothing a silk purse out of the sow's ear of Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act. Now, maybe the people in the Federal Trade Commission don't want to be called a sow's a pig's thingy bob, but they have made <laughs> remarkable progress in creating something out of Section 5 of, of the Federal Trade Commission Act. What are the lessons that I think come from that bag of, of sources? One of the things that uh, Alan Fells said at the 2003 conference was you have to think as a regulator about your authorising environment, of which the law is only a component. And he talked about the formal and informal sources of authority. And he said, publicity and engagement as a tool for education enforcement and accountability is important. Some may suggest that a regulator should simply enforce the law and no more. <laughs> they should carry out the will of the parliament. I would argue, however, that this is not sufficient, especially in circumstances where there is significant uncertainty like privacy protection. That uncertainty will continue forever because it's the nature of the beast. It's just the nature of the beast. Responsive regulation was all about if you can persuade people with reasonable persuasion to be good boys and girls, that's a good thing. But if they're stepping out of line, they're going to get the warning. And if the warning's not good enough, you're about to knock on their door. And if that's not good enough, you're about to start whacking fines on them. And if that's not good enough, you're going to see them in court and take them to jail. But the whole idea of responsive regulation is that the expense to everybody of going higher up that pyramid increases. And what you're therefore going to do is by the behaviour of the regulator, everybody gets encouraged to go back down to the bottom. It's cheaper for them and it's cheaper for the regulator. But the um, process of responsive regulation was invented decades ago now and is still worth coming back to as a regulator. Malcolm Sparrow's regulatory craft is often quoted with a single sentence, but there's actually two important sentences in there. One of them is, pick important problems and fix them. Yeah. There's nothing like 
being a successful regulator in the eyes of a whole lot of people if you've actually picked on something and fixed it. But the other part of what he said was, and then tell everybody. <laughs> There's a huge educational component, a multiplier in having been successful. And when you're successful, you're therefore given social licence to be successful again and be more adventurous. And that's what Alan Fells did extraordinarily well by being repeatedly successful. And I think we've got some uh, other regulators in the room who've done similarly well. What I found really interesting about the commentary by the Federal Trade Commission yesterday was um, the, the way, in particular, they've gone about strategic precedent setting. In an economy the size of the USA, with the Federal Trade Commission the size of the Federal Trade Commission, they can't do everything. They're, they're as resource constrained as the commissioner here in Bermuda or all the people in the Caribbean <laughs> that we heard about yesterday. In a comparative sense, they're just as resource constrained. I'm going to be extremely rude to John Edwards and <laughs> Elizabeth Denham and people like that and say, you're the best resource privacy regulator in the world. You're different from the rest of us. Um, most of us have been extremely resource constrained. So you have to be very strategic in what you do. You try and set maximum precedent with minimum effort, get a multiplier. When I was the privacy commissioner, we set up a process of every time we handled a complaint, how did we multiply the sound of that complaint? That's why we set up the process of publishing little screeds, two-page screeds, about each of the important complaints that we'd resolved so that the rest of the new world knew how we were thinking. We were trying to take a complaint from being one person made better to many people learning a lesson by just a little bit more effort. So I think that we need to go about it as a regulator remembering the three mandates that you have. The first mandate is the law. And the law does three things, not two, not one. Three things. One, it tells you as the regulator what you must do. It can tell you as the regulator what you must not do. And then there's a huge grey area in between. Occupy the grey area. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those things is this business of using your voice. When I was the Privacy Commissioner, my total budget for getting the privacy law in Australia that was about to be applied to the rest of Australia into the public domain, I had $50,000. That was one full page advertisement. The most important advertising I had was my jawbone. I grabbed every microphone I could possibly see and spoke into it. I held enough meetings to say I spoke to 10,000 faces in a year by going all over Australia and talking. If you think about advertising, when you're talking in the middle of a news bulletin, what you say is vastly more credible and heard than the same words said as an advertisement, a paid advertisement somewhere else in the program. Get into the news. A data breach is gold, but it doesn't have to be just a data breach. There's a whole lot of other things where you can draw lessons and have people think. That is part of the middle mandate, the grey area. Nobody tells you you can't do it. Nobody tells you that you must do it. But you can do it. And it is possibly the most important part of your remit. But that leads to um, the other two mandates. One of them is the funding, and we've discussed the funding a lot. And I'd have to say, when we come up to a lot of the privacy law reform we're doing in Australia, for example, I don't care. Because if they don't give the privacy regulator enough money to do the job, it doesn't matter what the law says. People will ignore it anyway. So that's your second mandate. What funding have you got? And your third mandate is the social licence. And that pick a small problem and fix it is part of increasing your social licence, your credibility with three interest groups, the government, the people who write your cheque, the media, who will promptly take you down if they possibly can, but will actually be a great ally if you can give them a great story. Um, one of the early things that Elizabeth did, blush, 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 was she printed T-shirts. And when they did some door knocking to um, be very visible with some of their enforcement and inquiry actions, they were wearing T-shirts that basically made sure everybody knew where they were from. It was a really seriously <laughs> good idea to make sure that they got some positive publicity in what they were doing. Um, and the third one is just the general public. You need to think about how you bring everybody along with you. That will be your most potent weapon. Um, and then the last one that I think came out very, very well from um, particularly the Federal Trade Commission is 
the enforcement muscle. I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, strengthen your enforcement muscle is really quite good. But the other point that they made, and I wonder how applicable it is more widely than in, the, in the, just the Uf, USFTC context, is we spend so much time talking about fines. My fines are bigger than your fines, or whatever it is. And remember, USFTC in a single fine has charged more in the way of fines than all of the other regulators around the world put together over time. So, you know, but then they said the most effective punishment is to require the data to be deleted, the algorithms applying to that data to be destroyed, and all the inferences drawn from that data to be also deleted and destroyed. You're taking away the future source of revenue. That will be even more punishment than the fines. I rather like that, which I'd thought of it. Um, anyway, and the last one I want to talk to about the regulators is literally yourself. It's a very lonely job sometimes, very lonely. Even your staff won't understand always what you're experiencing, let alone family, let alone other people. You actually have to recognise that it can be a very lonely job and you have to be very strong in yourself in the job and you have to have some ways of sometimes giving yourself space. If you're not thinking about yourself as a person, you're going to possibly um, find it very difficult. The other point that I'd make about yourself is end of term. It's literally in the space of a minute, you move from being rooster today <laughs> to feather duster tomorrow. <laughs> okay, think about it, think about it. Um, because it's, I mean, I, you can, I could feel the power going to my head while I was the regulator, and then I had to walk out the door and be Mr. Johnny Nobody. <laughs> And that's a, quite a psychological impact. And if you haven't thought about it before you're out of the job, when it happens when you leave the job, it's too late. And the beautiful thing about being a regulator is you know the day you're going to be sacked. <laughs> Three years to five years to seven years in advance. You've got some dime guys to prepare for it. But don't do it on the day. Um, OK, two more. <laughs> After I'd finished as the Privacy Commissioner, I met somebody else who'd recently finished in another um, regulator's job in Australia, happened to be ACCC again, and she and I were having a, a, a bit of a wine, uh, as in W-I-N-E, uh, at a uh, company director's <laughs> conference, and she said to me, because I've been through this experience, she said, Malcolm, when you finish off in a job like that, it's the best love affair you've ever had, and you're on the rebound. <laughs> that means you're about to make mistakes. Don't pick up somebody while you're on the rebound. You have to be really careful when you're on the rebound. And it's the same thing about what job you do next or where you go to next. You can actually be slightly fragile when you're finished in doing the most wonderful job you've ever had in your career to suddenly being a nobody. Think about all of these things as you're doing the job so that you can do the job better. <laughs> And the last one is, what happens as a consequence of everything that I've said? Disappear. The press will want you to be a critic of your replacement, to be commenting on your replacement. It's the worst thing you can do to the person who's taken your job. You literally have to go from being a loud, noisy, propagating person up to the end of your term, and then you have to disappear. That requires discipline too. So I just felt that if we were talking about how to be a good regulator, and part of the element of being a good regulator is self-management. And I thought it was something worth putting into the ring in addition to everything else you were asking me about. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Taki, did I see? Yeah. I mean, those are very, very interesting um, comments, some of which I have relived um, through. Um, but I wanted to really touch on um, your initial question, which, which was um, around how do you work uh, with other regulators? And I just want to draw on my experience. Um, in fact, when I was setting up Ghana's, that was an extremely difficult, but it turned out to be one of the best uh, relationships to build. And it was very deliberate one because we did not have all the resources. And so as a new regulator that was coming on board, uh, you did not also have the respect um, of, of the industry that you are seeking to get. 
And, and so you needed um, what I call the relationship that could build that respect. I remember one of our initial approaches was to reach out to the central bank. And then we had a requirement to register and nobody was minding us, nobody. And I couldn't blame them. We were locked up in some tiny office, um, you know, in the government ministry where everybody was asking, what are you supposed to, are you sure you can implement any of these laws in Ghana? So reaching out to, to the central bank at the time was extremely helpful. And within a short period of getting the central bank and its board to appreciate the fact that um, you know, the registration was important and our work equally complemented the work that they did. Within a very short time, we had the you know, whole financial sector you know, queuing up to do what we wanted them to do without much difficulty. Uh, we did the same thing with the communications regulator and, and we were then working on and on. So building that relationship is is extremely important. In Ghana's case as well, we had actually thought about this when we're developing the law. So also on our board, so we did not just have a commissioner, we had a board that constituted the commission of which we had a head that was the executive director that did the day-to-day -day implementation. On the board, we actually had the central bank there we had the National IT Agency, which is government's big IT authority also sitting on the board, and then also the communications regulator, and even industry associations rep were on our board. So all these really helped build very strategic relationships. And I love what you said about the media, because I think you haven't $50,000 was a lot. Um, I, I, we, we had nothing. I, I think one of our first videos that is still somewhere on the YouTube, um, I had to become an actor, you know, invariably, and my whole staff, um, everybody was in the video because we had to, I remember I became a script writer um, by force because of the resources that we have. But we had to be very ingenious. And one of the things that we um, created, we, we created what we call the press corps. And what was all that? We picked a bunch of media people, put them in the room, trained them, and made them feel special, <laughs> right? And made them understand the data protection issues. So these people were at our beck and call any time there was something publicly out there that had a hint of data protection. And we really jumped on that to raise awareness uh, with the limited resources that we have. Yes. Uh, you just raised one thing that I was going to just embellish a little bit more. Your engagement of the other regulators, yeah. the way I did it was actually I struck memorandums of understanding with about five or six of the regulators because one of the things business hates is more than one regulator knocking on the door on the same problem. Yeah. And so I struck MOUs with the communications authorities, with the um, ACCC because of competition and consumer protection law and, and two or three others. And it was a way of knocking on the door yeah. and saying, hiya, I'm the new kid on the block, yeah. at the same time as actually straightening out who was going to do what yeah. as a way of getting things done. So it formalised a bit exactly. of what you're and, saying. And, and in our case as well, because there were so many regulators, we were already having the challenge of, you know, government was already being bombarded with coming up with all these regulators knocking on our doors and harassing us and we can't breathe as businesses. So having that was also a way of trying to collaborate to really um, say we're listening also to, to the public, yes. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and we're seeing those sorts of formal relationships a lot more with, with models like the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum yes. in the UK. And, and so I'd, I'd be curious to get people's thoughts on those types of models too, but I know you had said you wanted to intervene too, Zeke. Yeah, so um, I, I thought I'll share some thoughts about why um, regulators should collaborate um, and less about how, because I think um, d different cultures, different countries, right? Um, I, I wouldn't ever uh, propose an, a memorandum of uh, understanding with a federal regulator in Singapore. They, they give me a funny look because it's a small place. 
We call each other, we sit down, and we have a discussion, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, so it really depends, right, on culture and, 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 and the country. But I'll, I'll talk about why it is important um, uh, in the sense that uh, you, you can look at it as there, there's a situation, there are situations when you, you need to have cooperation because uh, something happens and multiple regulators did, need to be engaged in the enforcement. So you, there, there needs to be a method of doing it, um, as, as has been observed. Uh, in those kind of situations, you can't have too many regulators tripping over each other. Uh, we, we, we do have a process where we kind of agree that who's going to take the lead and who else with spe specific experts, um, expertise might be able to provide inputs into that investigation. But the more important one, I, I think, for businesses is actually um, uh, in situations that don't involve breaches. And, and this is where, um, uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of um, um, uh, companies, right? And they have a new technology, they have a new issue, right? A new thing has come on. Uh, they need to grapple with multiple dimensions. Uh, it's, it's got a intellectual property issue, it's got data protection issues, it's got competition issues. And if regulators can come together and work on some of these things, it actually is a very powerful um, statement to industry that, you know what, we coordinate, we are trying to solve problems. And, and um, it, through my experience, we've actually done that before. So um, multiple times where we come together, do joint studies, uh, uh, there was a big data uh, issue where competition, intellectual property, um, and us, we came together and produced a discussion paper, identifying the issues, giving our different perspectives. So it's helpful for industry when they're trying to deal with issues like, okay, if I want to get into big data, what do I do? Uh, other situations would be just get, uh, when, when we, the, the, the story behind the, the AI model framework for Singapore was that it started out where uh, we convened, right? I got all the other regulators together and basically it started out as simple as let's come up with a common language, use the terms and use the phrases and have a common understanding of how we're going to use these uh, terms and phrases so that we don't cause confusion to the industry. But one thing led to another, and then in the end, uh, we co-created uh, the, the model framework. So I think that um, it is very important for us to also um, get uh, regulators to come together to deal with some of these emerging tech issues uh, and uh, provide right, that kind of um, um, uh, coordinated point of view. But because that's essentially it, right? It's a point of view at that point in time, but it, it's helpful. So, so I wrote down for my 2024 to-do list, I don't know if this aligns with everybody else, but we, so we need to define harms in a structured way and set reminders to review that going forward. We need to define risk management while keeping it in the personal context as well. We need to go look up Article 5 of the GDPR <laughs> in all the languages. There is um, actually a, an excellent paper by Gian Claudio Malgieri that, that does that for us. It, it looks... Uh, so now you have no excuse yes. at all. Uh, you just go read the paper. Um, so identify the outcomes you want to achieve. How are you going to make people's lives better? Um, uh, pick, um, pick an important problem, fix it, and then tell everybody about it. <laughs> make sure you do that. Uh, and, uh, and engage with your regulatory colleagues, whether that's a formal arrangement, an MOU, sitting down with a meeting, talking about common definitions for words, anything I've left off the list. What, <laughs> any concluding thoughts from anyone? I think um, I would add to the summary the word strategic. It's not just pick a small problem and fix it. It's within the context of where, where is my small group of people going to have maximum impact and for example when I was the commissioner the, the arc of the strategy was the social license didn't exist for a couple of years to actually take a tough enforcement action there had to be an educational period before you could then say okay people's time is up no more excuses we're going to take you to court or we're going to run a stronger enforcement action um, I think the collective mistake that we made in Australia was we were too nice for too long so we made a strategic, collectively, a strategic mistake. 
but you do actually have to think about where are you at in time, what is your um, res resourcing available, who are your allies, and actually have some strategic direction in place to do what you're going to do. And in a way, that's the huge difference between being a regulator and a judge. A judge does a case by a case by a case, whereas a regulator has to be much more strategic and seeing the arc of where things are going. Yeah, I think one thing that I, I want to add to all is that um, I agree with you, it's a very lonely place um, as a regulator to be. I remember when I was set in Afghanistan's data protection, probably the only English speaking at the time in West Africa. And so um, building strategic relationships was extremely important. And I did that both within Africa and to get the experience of other uh, DPAs mm -hmm. and because they had similar experiences to what I was going through. And then I also built um, outside of Africa. So we had a very uh, unique relationship right from the beginning with the ICO. And I always say that we picked a lot um, of experiences from there in really helping us build our strategy. And right from the beginning, I remember we actually, Steve, I don't know whether he's around here, uh, we had to formally. Um, your wife down the back. There. Yes, we had to formally get the ICO to bring us someone because I remember the board, I was the only person sitting on a board of about 12 that only understood data protection. So having him over and talking to the board and helping us develop an initial strategy was extremely helpful. So, and of course, conferences like this was very helpful as well, because I learned a lot by meeting other colleagues and hearing from the experiences. But for me, the conferences were extremely useful to see what, especially when you're looking at the emerging issues where you did not have the resources and the capacity to you know, grasp all the knowledge there. So yeah, that's just something that I wanted to. Well, I, I can finally report firsthand that the flashing red light is very effective. <laughs> but I'm going to use my prerogative to let everybody say something else if you want. So, Eduardo, go for it. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I've learned a lot about the role of uh, being a previously commissioner, so I, I want to be one because it sounds amazing. Um, no. <laughs> no, honestly, it sounds, it sounds like a very hard uh, really? job, and I can, I can see why alliances are important. So here's a, a, a tip from, from me. Build alliances from everyone, not just other regulators. Yeah. I mean, I, again, you know that. But to me, I mean, I've been coming to this conference for, for, for many years. And one of the good things about this conference is that, I guess, I would like to think, it shows to regulators that previously professionals, whether you are in industry or in, uh, in a law firm or a consultancy or, or wherever you are, we are all on the same side. Yeah. We are all involved in this world and in this work because we care about these issues and we can debate the law, we can debate the practices, what is more efficient, what is uh, more intrusive. But ultimately, I think we can all learn a lot from, from each other and I learn a lot from, from you guys and I, I'm, and I would like to think that there's uh, a contribution that the non-regulators can make to the regulatory community. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. One of the things that I did Eduardo was particularly when it came to health information, I realised the office and you know me myself were particularly unskilled in the area of health information. So we set up a health advisory committee and it was potent. You know, you learn, you know, a person who from the nurses federation there, the medical people, the pharmaceutical people, uh, a person basically a medico legal kind of person, and you have them around the table for your agenda and you learn yeah. so much. Yeah. And I do think advisory groups have a lot of yeah. potential. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> well, unless someone's beating down the door.